Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you to all those people who are here today. Uh, music and imagery, films and television, go back a long way. If we look at uh, D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation, made in 1915, about the American Civil War. This was such a popular film in America that it was shown with hundred-piece orchestras. So you would, they, would tour, they toured America with several hundred-piece orchestras accompanying this film. So it's always been, music and film have always been very much together. Um, now, I've been told that uh, we have some experts, well, I've, I've met them, and they are indeed experts, some of the, the greatest composers of the world are here to tell us about their task and what they do. Um, without any further ado, let me bring them on, who are in no particular order, but I shall bring them on in this particular order. First of all, we welcome Mal Michael Price. Michael Price. <laughs> Drew Masters. And finally, Anne Dudley. Okay, um, so I, I'll, I'll give people's credits as I speak to them. Michael here, but the credits I've got for you here are, are quite stunning. Um, you have um, worked on, uh, Sherlock Holmes is one of the, uh, the pieces that you've worked on. Um, what other films have you and TV stuff have you done over the years? Has it been mainly drama? Yeah, I, I, I did the kind of um, coming up through the ranks route. So I was assistant to a composer called Michael Kamen for five years. Uh -huh. So together we did uh, Band of Brothers and the first X-Men film and an album with Metallica and San Francisco. How does an assistant to a composer work? What do you do? Uh, depending on the, uh, on the mood of the composer that you're assisting at the time, <laughs> that's, that's anything from... Um, uh, filling in a couple of gaps for them mm -hmm. if they're a little short of time or if there's something uh, michael my old boss was um famously late for for everything in a wonderful flamboyant way so we got to conduct the top five symphony orchestras in the world for 10 minutes each time at the start <laughs> of each session as he would be whisking in from a cab from somewhere else so you i, I think there's in music there, there really is a strong tradition of, of kind of of, of learning the craft, because mm -hmm. as well as the art, there is a craft as well. Um, so I spent five years working with Michael, then five years working as a music editor on some feature films. So I did the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And so what, what, does a, what does a music editor do? Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because in terms of um, TV versus film, often because of the, the resources in TV being slightly smaller, um, then a lot of the roles are, are compressed together. But on a, on a big feature film, um, you really need a team of people to accommodate the fact that you're generating a huge amount of music for something like a, a Lord of the Rings very quickly, um, and also the pictures changing at the same time. So, uh, so Howard Shaw, the fantastic composer of that show, might have written a, an amazing battle scene with orcs and wizards, and then literally as he finished that, the scene would have been recut. So then you need more and rocks and less. So would that scene have been recut on the basis of what his music has already done with it, or have they just recut the scene irres irrespective of what the music is? There's a sort of there's a, a complex kind of give and take between the picture cut and and what the music's doing. Um, sometimes um, temp music, temporary music, is laid in by the picture editor. Mm. So there is some existing music that they've worked with, but often as all the elements of a film pull together and uh, start to influence each other, then small changes have to be made. So when the visual effects shots come in, somehow that scene isn't as tight as it needed to be, so small changes are made then. Somehow when you put certain kinds of music, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see from all, from all of us that um, a certain cue, or a musical cue, can mm -hmm. change entirely how you feel about a scene. Um, it would be lovely if more picture editors did recut their picture to our lovely music. That happens once in a while, but mm. often we're just part of a complicated process. So are you, you're saying you're part of a complicated process, but it's quite often seen as, as, as one of the last things that's yeah. brought to production. And that's, are you ever in a situation where somebody says, oh, we've edited a film, we're absolutely happy with it, it's 85 minutes long, now give us the music. Does that ever happen, or is that just being naive? Uh, once, in a, once in a blue moon, there's, there's sort of this um, ideal uber process that could possibly happen where you get sent the script and you, you have 12 months to work on ideas and then you're given a finished cut which never changes. Mm. Um, but I think part of being flexible and, and adaptable, the sort of part of the craft side as well, is, is um, making sure that, that technically you can cope with the changing demands mm -hmm. while not losing sight of the art as, as well. Because often I think if, if you allow yourself to be overwhelmed with 
everything that's changing, mm. then you, sometimes you can lose sight of the fact that when our audiences watch it, they don't know how hard you had to work to get there. They just see the final thing. As long as it doesn't look like hard work. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It has to look effortless and, um, and, and, and retain that emotional connection, however many times you have to work. Mm. Really. Well, you, this might be a good uh, opportunity to have a look at this scene that I think oh, you're going to yeah. show us via your, your laptop. How these things work is beyond me, but yeah. uh, there should be a projectionist <laughs> up there smoking a fag, but apparently it's not. Um, so what are we going to see here? This is... Uh, well, I, I just thought I'd uh, um, bring for um, everybody uh, to have a little look sort of behind the curtain to a certain extent. This is a scene from Sherlock, uh, which I scored with David Arnold. And this is um, the the clim climactic scene of um, season two with um, Sherlock and Moriarty having a confrontation on the rooftop. Um, and for, for those people who sort of spend most of their time living in cutting rooms, watching editors edit, or sometimes get to come and visit a composer, most of what we do now involves computers mm -hmm. quite a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the stage. So, so I think everybody can see um, that I've got, uh, basically I've got a picture of the, I've got a copy of the, the film on here. I've got some dialogue up at the top so that I could just hear what the, the characters are saying. Second, that I am one of them. But as this is the actual um, program that I'm using and, and, and this is the, the actual session that David and I made for this, then down at the bottom of the screen here, I feel like I need one of those sort of laser pointers with a little <laughs> kind of little red dot. Well, you're looking at all the sort of the, the details of the music here on the left here, where you're talking about there's, there's horns in there, there's a bass trombone. Absolutely. So this is a whole virtual orchestra yeah, in, yeah. In, in the box. Uh -huh. so, so looking from the start of this particular scene, I can uh, solo some of these sounds at the bottom, which are very specifically sort of tension generating sounds mm -hmm. layered up. There's a, a variety of sounds down at these bottom, down the bottom which are synthetic, but mm -hmm. there's one particular one which is very idiomatic to Sherlock it, um, and to how we sort of devise the music for the show, which is this one particular little, little sound. Um, anybody who's seen the show would recognize that little motif which is actually just a ballpoint pen bouncing on the bridge of a mandolin so, oh, so really? we're sort of where but when you when you play that in between that sounds like, like a piece of music even i could play <laughs> yeah, exactly. if that's what it is everybody can have a go with it when they get home um, but when you put those particular um elements together and start to apply such significance to them so if you've repeatedly used either a motif or a particular sound, mm. then they start to take on meaning within the context of, of the show. Um, this one particular scene, I think, was uh, the reason I wanted to bring it along was also because of um, decision-making, mm -hmm. emotional decision-making in, in music when you're writing for a scene, because I think some of the, some of the time, um, uh, composers and um, um, program makers um, have to have a discussion about whether they want the music to tell you what's happening on screen mm -hmm. or what's about to happen on screen or more interestingly internally what's happening to the characters and so what i really liked about this particular scene is that it actually changes uh, the music changes when the interior life of the characters change mm -hmm. so basically when sherlock thinks he's in charge it moves over to his side. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as Moriarty, in, as soon as Sherlock loses that sense of security, then nothing else happens. It's just a conversation on a rooftop. Mm. But the music underneath is giving you that sense of insecurity and that maybe he's questioning what's happening. But you've got to be, you've got to kind of soft pedal that a bit though, haven't yeah. you? Because if, if that becomes too big a thing that you're doing, you, you start to swamp everything else that's going on. Abs absolutely right. And, and there's, uh, there are then moments that in a really beautiful show, I mean, it's a genuinely a privilege to be to have worked on Sherlock right from the start with David, because what happens when, with a really beautifully craft, crafted script that's really well shot is that there are opportunities built in to come to the fore and say something musically because everything else stops. Mm -hmm. in, in this particular scene, um, there's lots of underscore underneath dialogue where you're holding back, holding back, and holding back, but then there's a certain point when there's, uh, if you've not seen the scene, I, I, I would spoil the, the big moment, but there's a point where everyone stops talking and the music is given its head and mm. the music can then push that moment through. Mm. If you played that same bit of score underneath the, the dialogue, it would be intrusive and it would, you know, it would, you'd feel sort of bullied. 
And it's part of your composer, your, 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 your strategy. It's sometimes silence. Oh. At which it's, it's the thing. Do, 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 do producers sometimes <laughs> say, you've composed me 15 <laughs> seconds of silence? <laughs> I hope you're not going to charge me for that <laughs> yard and a half of quiet. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's sometimes genre-specific. So uh, there's a sort of thread through most of the fantasy films where music will be an accompaniment to everything, so mm. nothing happens without music. Mm -hmm. But then in, um, in European cinema, that's absolutely the opposite. I, I can remember scoring a, a Danish film for Lars von Trier's company mm -hmm. a few years ago, and uh, um, we questioned over a very long process literally every note's right to exist. And so I'd written them about 60 minutes of music for this movie. We ended up with, I think, 12, because we just took everything out and thought, well, it works without it, so let's take it out and take it out. Um, but the difficulty then, bringing that into a TV world, because uh, I'm working on a, a couple of shows for ITV at the moment, Jekyll and Hyde and, and Unforgotten, both of which are, are, are just in production at the moment, is that you're existing in a noisy world. Yes, C yes. Cinema, I think that one of the, the delights of cinema is that you, you go to an enclosed space to watch it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so the, in, in a way, the, kind of, uh, the frame for it is dark and quiet. And certainly in, in the last sort of 20 years, they, the cinemas started to use sound a bit more creatively in terms of like the rear speakers and all that kind of thing. Is that something that, that if you are composing for cinema that you consider, you sort of, because I mean, there's, there's a particular moment, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a sound thing rather mm. than a music thing, but in the film Master and Commander, mm. there's a moment where suddenly the, the, there's a creaking floorboard over, over here, just behind you, which you haven't heard for a while, but it sort of, it gives you the place of being on the ship, You're, you are totally in that environment, because the soundscape is also telling you that the ship's crow, crow nest is up there and the seagulls over here and all that sort of thing. Definitely. So do you now take that in, on board in terms of, I'd like, oboe, left, right-hand speaker <laughs> sort of thing? Or? The, I, I was the music editor for a film called Children of Men, which is Alfonso Cuaron's film, Before Gravity. And we spent a, an enormous amount of time trying to create a musical world that fitted into the landscape that, that you were in. But we found some interesting things because we, we spent three days in a very expensive dubbing theatre working on where the car radio should come from <laughs> in this one particular scene where a car is attacked by other people. And we, we decided, we started with, it with a, um, a kind of photorealistic way where we thought, well, if it's coming from there and the camera moves to there, then it needs to move all the way there so that it's always in the same place. But we found it literally made you nauseous. Because yeah, if you're in a big cinema and you spin it all the way yes. around the room, um, so in the end, we, we kept the concept, but sort of flattened it into like a, a squidgy arc rather than the, the, <laughs> right, the full, yes, yeah. full thing. But, but then with TV, the, the, in, a, in a way, you, you want to play to the, uh, to the highest uh, possible achievements of the format. So a lot of people are watching in HD now. Some people you know, have got, um, uh, you know, we mix Sherlock in 5.1. Surround sound. And, in surround sound. But the... Um, you have to remember also at the same time that the straight line of the storytelling has to exist in less than ideal conditions and, and in mono, just in the little, the little telly, you know, the sort of like the, the equivalent of a radio in the kitchen. Mm. And, and so some, practically some of the decisions that you make, so the, the particular little bits of sort of drones and, and small noises that we're looking at then, um, they're sort of modified so that they don't disappear when you play them on a small... Mm, on a, on a, right, yes, so, yes. So you have to yes, accommodate yes. those. Whereas if this was a cinema score, you would just go brilliant. You could just go really low and shake the seats. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that there, are, there are those compromises um, now, but you, you sort of retain the bit that grips people emotionally. Mm, mm. Well, Michael, that's fantastic. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that with us. Now, we have uh, Drew, Drew Masters. Um, Drew, some of your cred credits here. You have Four Rooms, Undercover Boss, Bring Back Borstal. I missed that one. Um, hosted by <laughs> Joe good. Pasquale, I think you remember that. And um, we also have, well, you've also done The Taste, and The Apprentice is, is, is one of your big ones. So what's mm -hmm. the, what's, you, you do more reality shows, perhaps, than fact, than, I, than drama? I'm... I'm now doing a lot of drama, mm. and uh, I is did, there a difference uh, between the two? Massively, and I was I was listening to what Michael was saying and thinking that actually my experience is actually quite different um, in a lot of ways. Um, in the dramas I've done, I've been very lucky that mostly when they send a locked picture, which is what we call it when the picture's finished and you you score to it, um, mostly it stays locked. And I've been very lucky. I think um, I did uh, three series of Silk. Um, with Rupert Penry Jones and Maxine Peake, um, which um, you know pretty much never changed. I mean, every, every episode 
was just presented to me and I had, you know, whatever time it was, obviously not a year, I think, you know, a week or so to And would, to that, be a, would that be a typical uh, scheduled timetable to have about a week to...? Um, I, I find... I think the first episode of a new series, you've probably got a, two or three weeks to, right. to come up with something, and then it gets faster and faster. So, you know, is there a three feeling or four that days sort of sometimes. Non-musicians like myself, music is a, is a, you know, is a language, a beautiful language, but we, we, don't, we don't know the secrets of it, or we don't, we, we're not fluent in it. We, we, we know when we hear it. So does, do you get sort of... Do you, have you had odd times where somebody expects you to be able to create something in five minutes when you know it's going to take at least... A week. Uh, absolutely always, yes. And I think that's where, where, where <laughs> is we're that standard, is it? Yeah, it's absolutely standard. And I think that um, it comes from a, a lack of understanding, but also I think that when producers are focused on meeting certain timescales, mm. they don't really care what's involved. The, the fact is they need the music. And, you know, I, as you say, I come from a, a factual background, and I still do quite a lot of factual stuff because I really enjoy it. And actually, Bring Back Borstal, funnily enough, was, was something I'm really proud of that... Um, I approached very much as, as a drama, um, and I got... But, but the factual side of things mm. is totally the opposite of drama. So you almost never get a picture that's final. So you're constantly reworking the music. As you're writing the music, someone's editing that scene. And you have no idea how that music will work in mm. the restructured scene. And then they'll send it back to you with your music all chopped up that you literally just finished an hour ago going, that's great, can you now just rework it to fit this new picture? Uh, and it's just a constant reworking process. Do you get the impression that they think there's a button that you press that just that mark, make it better? Well, I, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's simpler than that. I just think that nobody really considers it. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's literally a case of they, they keep asking until you say no. Right. Uh, and I think it's the composer's job to... You know, I pride myself on being collaborative. I really enjoy working as part of a team, and I think that... You know, teamwork brings out the best in me. Um, I think that if you just work on a project and are left to your own devices, it can be lovely. But I think if you kept doing that, you would never really necessarily grow. Well, as if you composer. collaborate with good people, you always end up with something that you wouldn't absolutely. Have come up with on your own. And whilst I hate it when I get notes, yes. I also kind of welcome them because I think notes make things better. Uh, are there any terrible notes that you can share with us that you've been given? Um, I mean... Without mentioning any names, obviously. They're, they're always difficult because actually the worst thing about notes is that, you know, that you will get a director, a producer, an exec, and possibly a commissioner all giving their notes. In drama, certainly the director's notes are usually the ones that you're really trying to consider because it's their, their vision. Um, however, if the exec completely disagrees. So uh, at the moment I'm scoring um, a, a three-part BBC drama called Capital, which is based on the Jan John Lanchester book. And uh, it's directed by Eros Lynn, who is you know, a fabulous, fabulous director. And he's done an incredible job with it. And his vision for it is just slightly different mm. to the exec and writer's vision for it. And that makes a very uncomfortable position to be in, because uh, and it's about degrees of emotion. Uh, I like to write quite emotional music. Um, and it's where, where is it enough? Are you trying and to serve free masters then in that description? Uh, to an extent, to an extent. And I think what you have to do is you have to please all. And I think that, that and it's very important. You can't just go, oh, well, the execs are wrong. You know, the director's the most important person on this. It just doesn't work like that. Everyone's vision is right. And it's about where do we find the compromise? And, and actually, I mean, I think we'd all agree that, that get, it, it's all about degrees of taste. And so is a scene, are you overdoing the emotion too much? And this is what this particular conversation is about in, in this particular instance. It's like, are we over-egging the emotion or are we, you know, holding back too much? Mm. And some people want to hold back more, let the drama speak for itself, don't make the audience feel too much. Other people are saying, let's, the, let's, let's give the audience a big emotional kick at this point. Yeah, and, and I suppose a good, a good word is you're enhancing, hopefully. And you can be enhancing whether it's a, a, a very simple chord structure or, or something that's grand. And yeah, and, and music's role is different in every cue and in, in every show. And uh, Michael touched on that before. I think it's um, sometimes you're there to do... I mean, I think when music's best, it's often it's saying the things that the characters can't say. Mm. So that, that was a great example there where you, the, the shift of power has, has maybe moved from a character. But that you can't necessarily sense that from 
what they're saying to each other, or perhaps you sense it, but it, you know, that it's, 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 it. not, it's, a, it's, it's very subliminal. It's, yeah. it's, not, it's not holding up a big sign saying he feels this, but it's... An easy example is, is two people um, having a, a very you know, a, a loving conversation where they're sort of expressing their love for each other, but you know one character has... You don't, or you maybe don't know, one mm. character has you know, some other purpose, some, something bad's happened, maybe they're cheating on them or something like that, and you score in a much darker way because you're t letting the audience know that not everything is right here. And I think that that's, you know, again, where music's playing a role that it's doing something... When it's at its worst, I think it's when it's just emphasising something that's very obvious. Yes. So you've got someone crying because a loved one's died and you play very sad music. It, what's it doing? It, it, you know, the, the drama is there, hopefully, if you've got... A good script, if good it's, directing, if it's, good acting. If it's acting. not on screen already from what you're seeing, then the music on top of that is going to make it look a bit sort of... It can be very saccharine, but yeah. it, also just, it just over-eggs. It just, it, it, its purpose is sort of... And in factual, what we do a lot, and I'll lump myself into this as well, it's my fault as well, uh, but we're, we're all guilty of it, is that we are terrified of silence. And so you'll notice in programmes like The Apprentice and various others, it's just music, music, music mm. all the time. And it always has a gear change every minute, possibly every 30 seconds. But I was looking at the title sequence for The Apprentice a, a couple of series ago, and which, you're, which you wrote the music for, and there's an awful lot of crash zooms going in. There's pans up here, close-ups of people walking across bridges. I mean, it's every, every second the camera's doing something. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you... Are you, are you writing specifically? Do you ever one of those sort of cues? Are you trying to find something as a zoom in that gives you a, a sort of, this is the person we're looking at? Are you, are you minutely writing it to that degree? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very... Um, when you've got quick editing like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean this is the beauty of, of using computers as well, because if you're writing with just, in the, in the old fashioned way, with just sort of clicks, and um, we used to have these uh, things called streams, I, we still do. I, you may still use them, I don't know. Um, where you get a little uh, sort of white line going across the, the, the top of the picture with, with then a, a sort of pop, uh, big flash of light to, to highlight where something's coming. And, you know, uh, in the old days, the, com the conductor would just stand up, the composer usually would stand up with the orchestra, conduct them and just get them to hit those points. You couldn't be quite as, as sort of forensic as we are now. I mean, mm. we, we, you know, there are some greats who did some amazing things, but generally you don't hit things quite all the time in the way we do now. Um, I, I will go in and I will literally mark up every single point mm. that I want to hit and what I want it to do first with the markers, and then I'll go in... Uh, yeah, Michael's got some there. <laughs> sort of at the t uh, it's not there anymore. There's, there's, there's little, loads of markers across the screen. Mm. And you'll go, hit this, you know, go quiet, uh, bubble along for a bit, um, and... You're, you, it, it's pretty forensic, and, mm. and then what happens in, in factual is that, um, as I say, whilst you're writing that, that scene's being re-edited, and it's a very collaborative process because actually uh, The Apprentice is a great example. The, the original music I wrote for The, the Apprentice uh, was quite sort of safe in its structure, mm -hmm. and then it got absolutely butchered by uh, one of the editors, where he just snipped it to pieces for all these crash zooms and pull-outs and things and made it so much better than it had been when I first <laughs> wrote it. And uh, it was amazing. It was a revelation. And I actually then rewrote it to the way he'd cut it. Uh, and he then cut it again and so on and so forth. And over the years, it's just evolved into various pieces of music which sound much better than I originally intended them to be. Well, that's the art of collaboration at the end, isn't it? Indeed. How did you become a composer? What got you into it? I wanted to be a composer from the age of three, and having slightly from three? yes, having slightly uh, crazy hippie arty party parents, they allowed me to indulge that, and I never changed my mind. Um, Can you remember the first piece of music that you thought I want? To, I want to do what that person's doing, or something. Uh, I grew up in a house listening to classical music and jazz, oh, and right. I wanted to be a jazz saxophonist. I wanted to be John Coltrane. And, uh, Still time. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, I sort of despaired at a certain point. I, I, I learned the saxophone, I, I played for years, I played in the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. I was not bad, uh, but I realised I was just never going to be as good as he was mm. ever. Mm. And so I decided to, to not pursue that. Also, I didn't really want to be... Uh, I like the idea of being a, a starving jazz musician, living in a, a leaky loft, but... The reality wasn't quite so good. No, it, it, um, it never is, is it? But I, I always wanted to, to score films. I always wanted to write for television. And I 
um, I just sort of single-mindedly pursued it to, to a point where I really wasn't qualified to do anything else and had no choice but to make it a successful career. When you listen to a film or you watch a TV thing or something, and uh, it's, do you, your composer's ear, are you, are you hearing stuff, are you, are you paying more attention to it than the average viewer would? Because I don't suppose the producers want the viewers to be paying that much attention to the music. It has to be part of the picture and part of the mix, but... Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's always a slight frustration. It's something I tell young composers when they, they come to talk to me, is that you know, if you um, are very precious about your, your music and the way it's used, you should go and write an album. Because, yes. if you, because you are providing a part of a whole, and you are, you're a service provider. You, you're, you know, the way your music is used, you can't always govern. Even in drama and film, where you'll supply stems and they may rebalance those stems, they may cut stems out. So, stems, what do you mean sorry, by stems? Yeah. So stems you'll have maybe all the keyboard instruments, all the strings, uh -huh. uh, all the percussion, all the brass, and they will all be layered on top of each other. They will run at the same time. So the sum of those parts is, is your mix, but you can go, oh, the drums are clashing a bit with the dialogue here, and they can just pull those drums down. Sometimes that's great, because it means your cue still gets played very prominently. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas if you've just had a mix, they just pull it right down and you wouldn't hear the music at all. So it can work in your favour, but it does also give them the, the licence to slightly rewrite your music sometimes. Yes. And I've, I've had instances where they'll take the string stem of, a, of one cue and place it on top of another cue because it kind of gives them what they want. But they're in completely different keys, completely different times. <laughs> uh, and it, you're just thinking, what is this? So uh, a perfect example there of sometimes the, the, the difference between the, 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 the musician and the non-musician. Um, we have with us also Anne Dudley, who is uh, many people who, who, who know our business will know her extremely well. She's composed uh, for such films as The Full Monty, The Crying Game, Black Book, and TV series such as Jeeves, Worcester, Kavanaugh QC, uh, Trial and Retribution, Breathless, and Poldark. Poldark has been perhaps the most recent of those. Um, Seeing what the other two guys have said here, when you get a, a commission with something like Poldark, for example, which would mm. be a series of books which are you know, written over the years, so we have a kind of idea of the landscape and the, the, what the stories are about, do you immediately think, ah, oh, yes, a stirring romantic drama, I've, I've, I've got a theme that would suit that, or, or, or do, you look, do you spend more time looking at the script first of all and, and talking to people before you even do any, any work at all? Um, well, with Poldark, I did read the scripts first, and they emphasised to me that um, a very important factor in the whole drama of Poldark was the placing of Cornwall. Cornwall is central to it, and how can we, how can we create this world, um, 1790s Cornwall? Mm. And um, so I thought it needs to have some sort of... Um, I went and actually, I did some actual research, which I don't often do, but I found um, a collection of Cornish folk music, which a, a clergyman had collected in the, 18th, uh, in the 19th century, and he transcribed the tunes. And I noticed from the tunes that a lot of them were in the Dorian mode. Now, no, what's as that? we have a piano here, <laughs> Paul, would you like me to demonstrate yes, the Dorian mode? Well, the Dorian mode is the, the notes that you get if you play a scale on all the white notes starting mm -hmm. on a D. It's not a major key and it's not a minor key, it, it's somewhere between the two. And if you use that, it's the, it's the sharp sixth mm. is a very sort of, um, uh, very characteristic element of that. And in some of the themes that I wrote for Paul Duck, I actually used this sharp sixth. I'm probably getting a bit too technical too soon. <laughs> but. Um, so, so yes, that that was part of the part of the thinking behind it. Um, the actual nuts and bolts of the music itself. What, what would the themes do? How would the themes be to actually um, illustrate this? Now, themes. This world? I mean, you have um, you have a main theme, and, and a main theme often is a, is is perhaps the. Uh, I, I think is often the most the catchiest part of, of the score. I'm, I'm thinking. Of, I mean, I was, we were saying just earlier, my favourite, one of my favourite theme tunes ever when I was growing up was the Avengers, the, yeah. the Laurie Johnson, bam, ba, ba, ba. You know, immediately I heard that when I was eight years old, you know, your hairs on the back of your neck yeah, would, exactly. would sit up and all that, really, <laughs> yeah. really exciting. But that music would be completely wrong for a dialogue scene or something else, because it, it just takes too much attention. You are just 
drawn to it. Yes. So a main theme for a programme can have that quality. Yes, I mean, should we, we could play the main theme yes, of yes. Paul's I'll, I'll just talk about it. Yes, I please. mean, one of the elements about it is the solo violin, mm -hmm. because I'm trying to represent the character of Ross Poldark, who's a man a little bit out of his time, really. He's born into the upper classes, and yet he feels an attachment to the working classes, and he's trying to reconcile the poverty and inequality that he sees around him. So I try to represent his sort of journey, if you like, with the solo folky violin. It's played by a a friend of mine, Chris Garrick, who plays in a sort of folky style against a more classical background. Mm -hmm. So having established that theme, I don't actually use it very often. Um, um, Do you go to the solo violin? To I indicate? use the solo violin a lot um, because obviously that's a very characteristic sound. And for the moments that I do actually refer to the tune again, there's some there's a particular reason that I'm doing so. Um, in the next clip, uh, it's much later on in the series, so mm -hmm. you can assume that the audience is familiar with the tune. So I don't, I don't feel the need to play all of the tune. I shall... It's up to the piano. Yes, by all means. <laughs> and um, so rather than do... I just do the first three notes. And then I use a sort of... A, a, a sequence of it. Why are uh, you keen to avoid the whole theme again? Is it, is it just simply because it's repetition? Well, no, because where I, where the scene that I'm just about to play you, it's much more troubling. Uh -huh. uh, the world's sort of turning on its, turning upside down. You know, everybody's ill, everything's going wrong. I'm trying to emphasise that the world that we set up in our opening titles is a much darker place than we might think. Mm -hmm. And um, so in this next clip, it's still played, there's a little violin intro and then, then the theme comes again. And, and there's a drone bass as well, the bass doesn't move. I, I think it would be, should we have a look mm -hmm. at it and we mm -hmm. can... Um... If I could somehow make amends. Mm -hmm. I'll be home tomorrow, tonight. I'll stay at the red line. We'll go well at the auction. You'll win all your bids. Get all the copper you need, and Carmore will be safe. It's amazing, really, how um, instrumentation... I mean, it's, it sounds Cornish, the music. I mean, how can, how can music sound Cornish? But it's, it does. It's... I fooled you, you see. <laughs> <laughs> if you said it was Yugoslavian, I might have agreed with you there. Right? But I don't know. It is interesting how that... It's, uh, the way that music affects us. You know, I remember there are certain rock albums. I remember there was a Neil Young album. I, the first three times I heard it, I happened to be eating shredded wheat for breakfast. <laughs> if I heard it now, I would immediately think of think shredded, shredded wheat. wheat. <laughs> yeah. So that sort of... Ha, we, do we understand how music affects us like that? Do we really sort of... I don't think we do. This? I don't think we do. I think what, what's very, very interesting about the marriage of music and pictures is we're still learning it. Mm. You know, and sometimes... The music gives structure to the pictures, and sometimes the pictures give structure to the music, mm. you know, and they both sort of achieve this wonderful logic to them. And so you think of Cornwall. Yes, you yes, know, it is. I, it, I can yeah. assure you I was born in the Thames estuary, <laughs> not, not the Tamar. Maybe it's, it's, the, it's the landscape and everything. I, I just thought of an example, perhaps, where, where music certainly played a massive part in the success of a film, which, of course, was Jaws. Yeah. And you know the story, probably you know the story that the Steven Spielberg's film Jaws, they had this rubber shark, which they were going to film going through the water. The only trouble was it looked like a rubber shark. And so there was no tension at all. So they, they hit on the idea of this, you know, when, when John Williams came up with a doo -doo 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 noise this, on the, the cello, whatever it is, double bass, and you're just looking at murky water. That's all you're looking at. Mm. But it's enough to grip you because you, you've, you've already seen somebody disappear in a shark attack. So you know there's one out there. 
And actually, you're looking at the most boring bit of film, of just murky water, but that, that motif coming in tells you, you can't see it, but it's there. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's, it's also, um, you can do a lot with instrumentation as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a solo violin playing the tune. In the next clip, that tune is taken up by the, all of the strings, um, because, uh, and the harmonies themselves get more complex and the bass note begin, begins to move. It's almost like um, there's now more to worry about. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of uh, other sound effects going on in there as well. I mean, I don't have a sound effects. The sound effects of the, of the horse carriage going through and, and mm. things being made. Do you, are you ever consulted on that sound balance? Uh, probably everybody would agree with me, not quite as often as we would like to be. <laughs> and sometimes some sounds sort of appear that you hadn't anticipated in your mix and uh, sort of can drown out all the subtleties that you've tried to achieve. So, so do you, is that a difficult conversation you have to have or...? Well, very rarely do, you, do I get to discuss with the sound editor. I don't know if really, you have you the same experience. I, I've had a few experiences where I've been consulted. I mean, there are various scenes that I've done where it's been flagged at the beginning. There's going to be, I'm sure you've had this, where there, there, there's going to be uh, sound design. So maybe voices are going to be very echoey or there's going to be lots of extra noise put mm -hmm. in. And so you know to stay out of the way of that. Um, and also, especially if you've got some sort of low drone for some reason, um, let's say, I don't know, let's use an example, I haven't had this, but, you know, spaceship going along, mm. you know there's going to be a big sort of mm, sort of mm. noise. There's no point in scoring right down at the bottom and just mm. adding to the confusion. Yeah, so true. occasionally you get those conversations. Mostly, you, you know, you, you hear it in the mix. Mm. I do attend all the dubs. I mean, I, there's, I, I can't think of a dub I haven't attended. So mm. um, uh, we actually won. It was terrible. <laughs> um, probably because I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that you, you are often subservient to effects, and, and I'm often surprised at how low the music is to, say, the horse and cart going past, mm. because actually mm. you'd think there would be more uh, emotional pull from hearing the music than the horse and cart, which you can see. Mm. 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 And you, you said you mentioned there was it a bass drone you said you had in that earlier scene that it was playing underneath the first time. Yes. Yeah. What, what, what does that, 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 that extreme bass sound? What does that do? What does that, what does that do to, for us to, to hear that? Does it anchor it or does it ground us? I think it, it can immediately heighten the tension. Mm. In fact, a lot of a lot of TV music that you hear is drones. Really, um, it's more interested in sounds and textures and it doesn't really commit itself much to a tune. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's fine, you know, that, that can really sort of heighten the tension of a scene. You, you hear a lot of that sort of stuff in sort of contemporary crime dramas and things. Mm. I mean, mm. music is just a language, just mm. like any other, and um, there is an established language that, that's happened over the last hundred years of, of mm. cinema that we understand, and so we tend to build on it, and obviously, Ideally, we're trying to always add to that language and change things and, and be clever. But a lot of the time, certain things work. So your example of Jaws mm. is a good one. Low, droney things mm. suggest fear and yes, drama yes. And, uh -huh. and tension. We know that. If you played high flutes going... Mm. Flu, 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 mm. It wouldn't... Not probably like that. Mm. Um, it, it wouldn't make you feel the same way. We just know that. And they're, Although they're, there is a sort of thing where you can sometimes, and Hitchcock did this successfully a couple of times, where you deliberately have deliberately choose entirely the wrong music. I'm thinking of the moment in Strangers on a Train where they're set in the fairground and there's a woman being strangled on an island and we see the sort of like her glasses fall off and we hear a carousel in the background mm -hmm. and it's and it's brilliant because it's 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 completely wrong of course mm -hmm. normally and the scene is shot with close ups and there's glasses falling down and everything it's it's, it's shot like, like classic hitchcock but uh, I don't know whose idea it was. It might have been Bernard Herman or somebody who was working on it, I don't know. But, but, so you can sometimes go a, completely against mm -hmm. what yeah. you should be doing. And Tarantino does that all the time, yes. um, yeah. famously in Reservoir Dogs. Um, it's, I, I think that those sorts of things are quite manipulative, but, mm -hmm. but work really well. Um, I think generally... Should you be, should you be, are you wary of appearing to be manipulative? Not especially, but I, I think it's, again, it comes down to taste. Mm. I think that something like that, um, 
would have been a very considered thing. Mm. And it works well because it's wrong. Yes. And, and so it, it, it draws even more attention to, to how horrific it is. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yes, it's it sort of what we're seeing is an unusual thing. And so it's, it's, it hasn't got the coziness of this works with yes. this. And was there any other sort of clips you wanted to show us on? Well, I, w I wanted to um, just uh, talk about these dramatic themes. I mean, mm. I like to use themes to follow a dramatic thread rather than perhaps a character, something like, you know, betrayal or unrequited love or something. Mm -hmm. And um, we have this wonderful character of Demelza, played by Eleanor Tomlinson, who she starts out as an urchin, and she, she does go on a great big journey. And... Um, the clip that I've got next, she's been, she's been rescued by Ross Poldark and she's become his maidservant and she's at, the big, she's at his house and she goes into his study for the first time and she's never seen books, she's never seen maps and she's really entranced by these, by these things. And um, I use the famous Dorian mode because the little tune that I use goes... If I'd just used the minor key, it would have gone... Which doesn't, to me, have that sort of tension that mm. the... And also, of course, she's a sort of working-class character. I suppose she's sort of one of the folky characters. Um, and this little tune that I use for her um, goes through several perm permutations as she sort of um, does this journey from being an urchin to being mistress of the house. So shall we just have a look at this mm. next clip, please? It's, it, because of the, it's interesting, the way it's shot as well, because it's going for sort of period lighted and all that kind of thing, you, that has to, does that in some way constrain what you can do? Uh, it, would, it would be ridiculous to have a synthesizer or, or something well, play in there. Yes, but actually quite a lot of those sounds are synthesizer sounds. Oh, are at, they? At the beginning, yeah. There's right. sort of subtle electronics going on. Um, it's a question of taste. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, people, you sometimes, sort of, you know, people write into points of view or they complain about the, the noise of music in documentaries and various things. I, mean, I don't think it's got any louder. I just think people's televisions have probably got slightly better. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, it's a really, it's a really valid point because I, I think back to, it's almost back to the cinema versus TV argument is that, you know, when somebody's watching Poldark or Sherlock or any of these kind of shows, then if, if there's something that, that takes them out of that experience, um, even if it's outside your control because they've got mm. a terrible TV that sounds rubbish, mm. then, then if there is anything that's possible to do without compromising your show, um, then I think you know, it, falls, it falls on our responsibility uh, on our shoulders to try and do that, to try and accommodate that, because ultimately sort of ho holding to a a sort of purist position that, no, this works beautifully in a fabulously lined up um, cinema or screening mm. room, I, I think is, is a bit of a shame. It's, it's almost like we should, uh, you know, as composers, try and find the, the shortest way between A and B to, to make that musical point that, that still, the integrity of it still holds up, even mm -hmm. if you're watching it on a, rub it on a laptop. I'm frank, cause, I mean, the number of people who watch, watch all our shows on iPads it's, now in the mm. back. Now that's, that's, uh, that must be quite annoying, actually, because technology has gone so far the other way in terms of high-def pictures, yeah. and suddenly you're, being, you're listening to on a, on a speaker that thin, 
it, I mean, it, it really is a sort of like both a technical and a sort of and a, and a just a humanly frustrating thing. It's like it's much better than that. And you're listening to honest. But I, th I think talking about the, um, the, the levels of music, um, obviously, with my experience of factual, um, it's very different. So, it, you know, when we do a drama, we will all, I mean, I presume always sit down with the director and go through the spotting notes of where the music's going to be mm. and what it's going to do. In factual, you have almost no control whatsoever about where the music's used or how. So I, I got an email um, a while ago about one of my shows from somebody saying, you know, I really enjoyed the show you did, um, wrote the music for last night, but unfortunately it was completely ruined by your music. There was, there was too much of it and it was too loud. And I wrote back and said, fair point, there was too much of it. It wasn't my choice. I wouldn't have put it in all mm. the places that it was put, but it wasn't my decision and it was too loud. Uh, again, nothing to do with me. Why, does, why, does that, why is that decision made sometimes? Is it because people are not, aren't, uh, they're not entirely sure of the pictures they've got and they're hoping that a bit of music in there will lift it? it yeah, but I think uh, that's often Music can only case. do so much, though. I think that, that you, there's this sort of... A bad film with good music would still be a bad film, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. mm. It's an interesting your, your Hitchcock example because there's basically that... I think the, kind of the juice in the music and picture combination is, the, is in the gap between them, so mm -hmm. you can, you can mm -hmm. stretch yeah. the music away from the picture mm -hmm. to a certain point, mm -hmm. and, and the, it's interesting. But then you, if you pull it too far, it just totally detaches, and it's just like, that is not the right music mm -hmm. for that picture. Mm -hmm. But it also, as you say, every, every piece sort of bounces off the one before, mm -hmm. and you, um, in drama, you, you're certainly trying to create an arc for your music, I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about the exactly. thematic d d development, and you're trying to do it across the series and across the episode, because mm -hmm. obviously each episode has to exist in isolation. Do you think audiences generally notice that, that you're doing that? Hopefully not. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think they feel it, yes. I, yes. I think they are aware of it, because mm -hmm. otherwise why would we bother to write yes, yes. repeating tunes, you know, and... Mm -hmm. and you know, to, 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 com to convert them and make them develop in the way, way that the drama develops. I, I, think, um, I think they can be a very important element of your sort of musical arsenal, as it were. Wow. But, but I am very much with you that it's sometimes the law of diminishing returns. If you don't have periods of quiet between mm -hmm. the music, then it doesn't have the impact that it can have when it comes in. Yes, maybe it's sort of if it's there constantly. It's a bit like li living next door. It's like living next to a main road. You're hearing it the whole time, and you stop hearing you it stop because hearing it's there it. the whole time. Yes, yes. And I think that the uh, factual program makers are often. I sound like I'm just completely whinging about. Uh, no, no, this is your chance. Program. Tell them. Uh, <laughs> there are some positives as well, but I haven't got time for them now. Um, th th I think that th they're often guilty of exactly that. It's that sort of traffic noise, that underground bubble of, of music all the time so that when the big moments come the big music has to be so big mm. to cut through yeah. and it's often preposterous one of the reasons i like doing factual programs actually is because i get to write preposterously big music um <laughs> that, that's completely ridiculous and you would never get to write in drama really so, can you give us an example of a... um well pretty much anything in the apprentice right. is, is preposterously <laughs> stupid and, and, big and <laughs> bombastic and i love doing it and it's a great opportunity to write is it because what we're watching music. is kind of it, it, Pantomime television isn't quite the right word, but it's, but it's highs and lows. It's like, you know, these geniuses um, who proclaim themselves, all the, all the, and then we see yeah. them being utterly stupid. So do you think I've got a bit of utterly stupid music that will suit this fine? I have so many cues called people being numpties. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually keep meaning to look up what a numpty is because I have no idea. I think it's a it, Scottish term, I think, isn't it? Numpty, I, I think. Hope I'm pretty so. sure. I it's, hope it's uh, not really rude. I, uh, no, 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 it's not really rude. It, it, it would accurately sum up most people who apply to be on The Apprentice, I think. Um, <laughs> There's one over there. Yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> um, I think one of the things I... You know, well, actually, we're coming towards the end of our time, so I'd like to ask you, who, who were you influenced by when you first started? Perhaps I could start with you. Was there a great film composer that you looked up to? Or? Uh, I, I think, for me, it was the... Um, it, it, and probably similar to quite, quite a lot of people who work in film and TV, not terribly influenced by other film composers, right, it's uh -huh. just by composers. Uh -huh. And so it's the, the real influences uh, for me sort of are the concert music or the sort of the Steve Wright minimalist music, all those kind mm, of things mm -hmm. where, the, where the music is front and center because I think that connection to, um, to the, the real peaks of, of musicians just expressing themselves. It's almost like 
connecting to that and then trying to bottle that, and that's the thing that you bring to, to, the, um, to the screen. Um, so yeah, it tends, to, it tends to be that sort of connection to the, to the great musical mothership. Yes, yes. I always thought Tchaikovsky would have been a very good composer for... There's so many of them would be amazing. Ratmanov, I mean, you know, yes. kind of Brief Encounter sort of... That's, he had his shot, obviously, for yes. his time, but they... Uh, yeah, you see... In, inevitably, I think with, with music for screen, you, you rarely get to express the full, complete range of emotion that you can... Uh, because you have, you're working to a picture, yes. Uh -huh. you, you, it, it's, sometimes I think it's like accompanying a singer. Yes. Where, so, so you're sitting there doing a beautiful job. Occasionally you get to do the little flourishy bit before they come back in again. Yeah. But effectively, sort of, you know, there, there are more things that we can say to... He's a bridesmaid. Yes, never the bride. <laughs> So Drew, what about you? I, I grew you said up you wanted to be a musician when you... When yeah, you I mean, up. I think the reason I want to be a composer and not a performer... I, mean, I, I went to music school for quite a long time and I, I played saxophone and clarinet and I just hated performing. I just am not a natural performer. Um, I love, what I love about composing is it's, it's just mixing sounds and being eclectic. And I, I was actually... I, I was in a few bands and things and always accused of being too eclectic and actually being a <laughs> composer for TV is a perfect place for someone who's really eclectic with their yeah. taste and I you know I love everything so it, when I listen to my music what I hear is I hear pretty much every note influenced by West Side Story <laughs> which I grew up watch I must have watched a thousand times mm. and but when I use rhythms and things I hear um, the police I was massively influenced by, by them um, reggae bass uh, so I was kind of a teenager in the 80s and there was all these things happening two-tone, all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. um, all that kind of influence. Um, I loved the sort of mixing of uh, electronica and, and uh, orchestral stuff, which I, I sometimes get credited completely bizarrely for, for sort of coming up with, I think, in a TV context. Um, but actually I was massively influenced by all, all the stuff that Anne was doing mm. um, with, with Art of Noise and, and um, all the Trevor Horn stuff. I thought, you know, oh, fantastic, yes, yes, uh, amazing stuff. And so there was all of that, plus um, a, 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 a wide range of classical music. I mean, if I had to pick a, uh, a film composer, it'd be easy. Bernard Herrmann, mm. um, utter genius. And I loved the, the scores he did. I loved the darkness and the madness and... Um, the singularity, Taxi Driver, mm. what an amazing score mm. and quite different to a lot of his others, but mm. amazing. Mm. And what about yourself? Well, it's funny, somebody asked me the other day, what, what's the first piece of music that you remember hearing? And this might surprise you. It's The Ugly Duckling by oh, Danny, Danny Kaye. Kay. And I remember being so moved by the bit where it goes, and not with a quack, with a glide, and a da 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 Crikey, how did the music do that? Yes. How did the music make the hairs on the You're back of my neck? You're a very fine swan indeed. Yeah. And then it suddenly yeah. it all sort of lifts up in yes. this wonderful way. And I remember thinking, I, I'd like to know how that works. You know, how do you do that? And, and that is, that's what music does, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it is that, I mean, we're concluding now, but it's kind of sort of where we started in a way. It, it is an incredible language that can move us in so many different ways that, we, as you say, you don't even understand yourself sometimes exactly yeah. how it affects us, but we just know it does. Um, well, I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you help me to thank um, the, our guests today, Michael Price, Drew Masters and Anne Dudley. Yeah.